John is a professor of, of management and marketing. He's, in the, he's from the Department of Managing, Management and Marketing. He's a, in the College of Business here. Um, if you, John gives you an interesting idea of where our faculty come from. If you look at his history, he started off as a physics major, as an undergraduate, and got a bachelor's degree in physics. And then the next line on his CV is that he has a master's of theological studies from Harvard Divinity School. And you sort of wonder where he's going there. And then the next line, suddenly he has a PhD in marketing. And when I look at that, um, I sort of see the typical path, maybe, maybe slightly atypical, but he's chasing the same thing that a lot of those of us who become professors are chasing, which is how do you understand what's going on in the world around you? And physics and trying to understand the physical world is a great way of doing that. Uh, going for metaphysics, trying to, to understand the world from that direction is another way of doing that. And let's face it, economics and the movement of money the, and, the, and how we decide what we're spending on and, and so on is another way of thinking about and explaining the world. So rather than take up a lot of time, I'm going to introduce you, come on in, find a seat, um, to, to Professor Middlestadt and let him talk about the commercial aspects of religious pilgrimage. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a way better uh, explanation of the circuitous path that led me here than, uh, <laughs> than I can usually give. Uh, I like to say that I studied the three between physics and religion and marketing. I, I've studied the three really important questions uh, that, that, um, that keep us awake at night. Uh, where are we? And why are we here? And is there a gift shop? <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, let me just start first by saying, um, uh, for those of you who are parents, this is Parent Weekend. And if you're a parent, if you're here with your child, um, uh, this is, you're going to see a variety of the kinds of things that we do at the university. Uh, uh, Mary Berman has done an excellent job of talking about really complex issues in, um, uh, in, in terms that, that make sense uh, and that, we can, that, that can engage us in the dialogue. Um, we're going to see movement and how we tie that to the natural world. I'm sort of the, I'm, I'm, I'm the bun, in, or the, the, I'm, I'm the piece in the middle. I'm not exactly sure what, what that is. But, but because of my background, my interest is in um, religion and the role religion plays in the marketplace, religious organizations as markets. Uh, what can we learn about marketing from studying one of the oldest institutions or the set of oldest institutions in the world and, and vice versa. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little about pilgrimage today and uh, Mary showed you a lot of data and a lot of charts and that was really good. Um, I just, I'm not that good. I'll just be frank with you. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, okay? And I've got a job for you. When we get done, I'm going to ask you which picture was your favorite, okay? So you're going to see pictures of people. You're going to see pictures of places. We start with a picture of my pilgrims. Uh, this is my wife, Patrice. Uh, many of you know her. Uh, and this is my son, our son, Matthew. Uh, Matthew in this picture is six years old. Uh, today he is 15, uh, actually on this very day, and I don't understand 15-year-old boys anymore, but he is the girls' swim team manager, and he's in Jackson <laughs> with about 30 high school girls. I, I was in the library. I don't understand that exactly. But our pilgrims here are... In front of, pictured in front of the house of Jacob and Claudia Dandel. And we'll talk about Jacob and Claudia Dandel in a moment. Um, I study uh, a number of things related to the role of religion in markets and vice versa. Um, this is a project that started in 2005 and has 
meandered a variety of ways, but really in terms of pilgrimage as an act of exchange. I'm, I'm interested in two or three questions, and we'll focus mostly on the first one today. But the first is, what can we learn about acts of pilgrimage uh, by applying a lens of exchange? Marketing is really the study of human exchange. And uh, so we're going to look at that a little bit. The, con the, the flip side question is, what can we learn about exchange by studying pilgrimages? We'll see a little bit of that. Uh, and most recently, I've developed an interest in what happens when pilgrimages fail. If you're interested in studying sort of the effect of markets and how they interact with pilgrimage uh, and to be able to really see an impact, you've got to start from the beginning, which means you've got you to call the pilgrimage right on day one, which is, you know, not that easy. And most of them have been around a long time, so I don't know, I, I, missed, I missed the starting point on it. That's, that's, that's sort of, we're going to focus on this first question a little bit. There are some, what we would call nearly universal aspects of pilgrimage. Um, you find it in almost every religious tradition in, uh, in, in the world. Um, uh, they vary, some of it is tradition specific, but there are some general characteristics and we're going to talk about those a little bit. In many traditions, pilgrimage is part of what it means to be a faithful person. In Islam, for example, there are a handful of obligations that every Muslim has. Uh, and one of those is at least once in their life they need to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, and so it is, a, it is a test of faith in some ways there. Um, when I say every religious tradition, we would say every religious tradition with the exception of one, and in our world it's a fairly large one, it's Protestantism, all right? Um, it is not part of the Protestant tradition, is, and as one who was raised a Protestant, but now is a regular attender of a Catholic church, this is a place where I see this difference. Now, historians, political scientists, uh, theologians would differ on the explanation of why Martin Luther was really down on the whole idea of a pilgrimage, was it because you were taking a pilgrimage to places outside of the, the area of the Reformation, or was it, did it have to do with the alliance with kings? Um, but his argument would be that if we are saved through our faith and not through the acts that we engage in, not through works, then there is no need to go on pilgrimage. It doesn't do anything for us. And so that was his perspective on pilgrimage. So setting him aside, we say, what are the kinds of things that are common elements of pilgrimage? And let's talk about just a few things. One of them is that pilgrimages tend to revolve around a physical place. They tend to be places either of uh, temples, mosques, churches, which are oftentimes built around important, significant religious uh, events. Uh, they may be places of birth. They may be places of death. Um, over time, they tend to become places of commerce, though, because as people go on pilgrimage, they need places to stay, they need to eat food, they need to buy gifts at the gift shop, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so towns and villages tend to emerge along the way, uh, and markets tend to uh, form. And this is my interest, and is the market formation question. Uh, common elements. Uh, they involve a journey. You have to go somewhere. These people here are on the way of St. James, which runs hundreds of miles from Spain and the Pyrenees and, and, and into France and into Italy and down to um, Santiago de Capistrano, where, where um, the trail ends. And this is part of, and it's not the ending, it's the journey that matters. So they involve a journey. They're transformational. They transform the people who are engaged in it. And this is really what distinguishes a pilgrimage from religious tourism. All right, so if you've been to Paris, you've gone to Notre Dame. Did it transform who you are? Was it an act, or, or did you go to see what was there? And, and there's a lot of places that we think of as religious sites that for many of us are sites of religious tourism not religious pilgrimage. You'll see a little of both of that today. Um, Karl Barth talks about a circle of faith, and he says there are people in the circle of faith and people outside the circle of faith. 
and those that are inside the circle get it and those that are outside don't. And pilgrimage is one of these things that people within the circle of faith, these are all people, Hindus, who've come to the Ganges River, which is a holy place for them, and they're involved in a religious ceremony here. But to you and I, they look like people sitting on a dock. All right? So they get it and we don't, and that's part of it. Um, we think of acts of having and occurring in sacred places, and the distinction we draw is between the sacred and the profane. By profane, I don't mean profanity. I mean the ordinary, the commonplace. And so places of pilgrimage tend to be separate from the profane. You've got to get out of where you normally are. The best analogy for that that I have is riverboat gambling, right? I mean, you've got to get out of where you are into someplace else so that your parameters of what seems reasonable change, right? It's, it's, it's you know, Part of, but that's not sacred profane. But but here you see this is this is the high holy place of, of Sikhs. It's up in the Punjab. They're highly structured and ordered in their events. So if you are a Muslim and you go on pilgrimage, there is a certain pattern of things that you must do when you follow the life of the Prophet Muhammad. And at one point you come here to the Kaaba, the cube. Uh, and the corner of this is, is the sort of the center of the universe. Muslims pray toward Mecca. Where do you pray when you're in Mecca? Can you just kind of anywhere? No. You pray towards this. And you see here this, these patterns here. These are actually people dressed in white robes praying towards the center of centers. All right? And it's highly ordered and structured. Um, why should a marketer care? I get this question a lot. Well, this is interesting, but why should a marketer care? And to us, at its core, pilgrimage is an act of exchange. People go on pilgrimage, oftentimes in an act of exchange, not necessarily a transactional, physical exchange, although that happens, but they're doing it for a reason. They're asking for something from God. It's, it's intercessory. It's a, it's a bargain. There's a variety of reasons. And they're engaged in it, hoping to get something in exchange. Maybe not in this world, maybe in the next. Well, that's what I study, is exchange. Now, what the currency is and the units of measure gets a little complicated here. But that's what we study, all right? It involves travel, consumption, ritual. And around these things, markets emerge. Um, and so sort of the, the, the operations question, the, the management question is, what does it take to run an operation like this? Just to put it in perspective, um, this is the sacred mosque um, in, in Mecca that surrounds the Kaaba. So you see here even more people engaged in that. Get the sense of the scale. What does it take? to run something like this. And, and the marketer in me says, well, you know, these people need guides. <laughs> they know where to go and how to get there. They've all got to eat. All right? uh, they've got to have some place to stay. All of these are market activities. Right? And for the most part, scholars of pilgrimage, anthropologists or theologians, study that transformational act, the meaning of the journey, not the transactions that happen along the way. That's what I'm interested in. Um, these things have economic spillover for people. All right? if, if you've got a community where people are coming on pilgrimage, it's going to have economic spillover. And just to give you a sense, this is the King Abdulaziz Tower here. This is a Fairmont Hotel. It's, it's, it's got 1,300 rooms. It's 601 meters tall. I can't tell you what that is in feet, but it is the fourth tallest building in the world with that clock contraption built on the top. It has a prayer room in the basement that can seat, or not seat, you don't seat, you kneel, 10,000 people. And to put it in scale, that's the Kaaba. All right? That's that cube that we saw all those people around. All right? Clearly, this has economic spillover. It's had economic spillover before there was Islam. So one of the things about Mecca was that in pre-Islamic Arabia, 
pre-Islamic Arabia, there were hundreds of gods. And your rights as a human being only extended as far as the boundary that your god could protect you. So when you travel into somebody else's territory, you have no human rights. And their job is to kill you and take your stuff. With one exception. With one exception. And that is, there was a commonly agreed set of rules that said, if you are on pilgrimage, you get free passage. So guess when people would do their exchange? Guess when they'd trade? They'd trade, they'd carry all their stuff with them when they were on pilgrimage. Mecca, this mosque, which predates Islam, was the home for 60 or 70 or 80 or 100 different gods. So you had all these people coming to Mecca. Imagine what that, imagine, you can sort of, to put it in our context, imagine the conversation that the Chamber of Commerce had when, Me when Muhammad said, there's only one God, right? They're like, do you know what that's going to do for business? If people don't have to come here, do you know what that's going to do? Right? Which is why they tried to kill him and he had to escape to Medina. That's the marketer's interpretation. There are theological reasons as well, but we'll leave it at that. All right? uh, it creates uh, what we call entrepreneurial opportunities. This is a man who works by the side of the Ganges rivers and if you, uh, River, and if you'd like to take a little water home with you, he will sell you a plastic bottle. All right? So all kinds of things come from this. Um, if you look at the literature that talks about, uh, about pilgrimage, there's very little talk about what we've just seen. In fact, um, Victor and Edith Turner in their 1978 book, an excellent book called Image and Pilgrimage in Christian Culture. This is the only paragraph I've been able to find anywhere that talks about how this happens. And he says, well, it starts haphazardly. People start to go. There's really no pattern. But over time, patterns emerge. And if you look down here at the bottom, he says, marketing facilities spring up close to the shrine and along the way. A whole elaborate system of licenses, permits, and ordinances governing mercantile transactions, pilgrims lodging, and the conduct of fairs develops as the number of pilgrims grow and their needs and wants proliferate. And I read that and I thought, my God, that looks almost like our definition of a marketing system from our friend Roger Layton down in Australia. A marketing system, I won't read it to you, but basically what they're describing is a marketing system. And my study is the study of the systems of marketing, not just the dyadic exchanges between two people. So what does the lens of exchange tell us about this? Let me just tell you a little bit about exchange. So exchange is the heart of marketing theory, the, the, the father of modern marketing science and mar modern marketing theory was a man named Ro Alderson who argues that parties only exchange if there is some benefit to them. We, this is different than how economists think about it. you trade because you've got excess, you specialize in something, you create an excess and then you trade for other things. But do you always trade? And the law of exchange, as we call it in marketing, says people only engage in exchange if there's mutual benefit, only if it works for both of them. But out of this emerge systems. And I'll show you a picture when I say systems. Um, I'm looking around the room, and I don't see a lot of people who may have gone to a Hannah Montana concert, but I'll bet you've got children or grandchildren who did, all right? And to us as users of this service, you know, it's a relationship between us, the audience, and Hannah Montana, but in reality, to make that happen, you've got this whole network of services and goods that make it happen. Hannah Montana and her sidekicks, the Jonas Brothers, are both represented by agents who've worked to deal with Walt Disney, and Walt Disney holds the merchandise rights. Walt Disney works with the lighting and the sound people who are also connected to the local unions. You've got to have a, ven you've got to have a venue, you've got to have food vendors, you've got to have a ticketing system. And you know, the, the, the marketing question is, what happens when Hannah Montana gets sick? and can't go on, right? which doesn't happen that often because she's quite healthy. But remember Luciano Pavarotti? Like one out of every three concerts he had to cancel. And it really created this complex 
problem. And so we're interested in the complexities that lie behind that. So let me give you a case study. Like I said, it's hard to kind of hit it at the beginning, right at the beginning. So we're going to go to Joseph and Claudia Dandel's home at the beginning of a pilgrimage, all right? Um, in Bavaria, Bavaria is a southern state in Germany. It's got about 12 and a half million people. I don't know, that makes it maybe the size of Michigan or Illinois, all right? Um, in that are a set of counties, all right? And one of them is County Ototing. It's about 107,000 people. That would make it three times the size of Laramie, twice the size of Cheyenne. There's really not a lot, trust me, I've been there. There's not a lot going on there. It's broken up into townships, and one of those townships is Markle on den Inn. Markle on the Inn River, the market town on the Inn River, right? In, you think, where have I heard of the Inns River? Well, you know where it starts? Innsbruck. That's it, Innsbruck, right? You've got the Inns, Innsbruck is on the Inn River, right? It's a gorgeous, there it is. Oh my God, there it is. It's a beautiful town. Sits on this river. If you've been to Europe and you've seen the rivers, you see these paths along the rivers, right? Because the barge traffic moves down the river. But in the days before barges had engines, how did you get it back up? So you had these trails where you would have teams of horses or maybe prisoners haul the thing all the way back up the river. Um, we don't do that so much anymore now that we have the internal combustion engine, but they make great bike paths, as it turns out. So they, so they maintain them. Um, here's the town of Marktel. We're entering the town of Marktel in County Oltating, and there it is, the home of Claudia and Joseph Dandel. And there are our pilgrims standing in front. And we get a little closer. And it is the home of Claudia and Joseph Dandel, but it is also the Gebirsthaus, the birth home of Joseph Ratzinger. Who is Joseph Ratzinger? Five weeks before this photograph was taken, he became Pope Benedict XVI, the first German pope in 500 years, or as they would call him, the Bavarian pope. They're not, I mean, there's, there's a regionalism here that's like, <laughs> he's not even, he's not German, he's not yours, he's ours, all right? And, and as you can imagine, the first German pope, the first, the home in which he was born, the town in which he was born, suddenly, as Victor and Edith Turner would say, people start to arrive. And this town has no idea what to do. The church has no idea what to do. This is what the house actually looked like in those days. And you'd look at that and you'd say, oh my God, he must come from a family of great wealth. He didn't. His father was a constable, a policeman. This floor of the house was the police station. This was the residence. All right. So if you were the policeman, the state owned the police station, and you lived above the police station. And it sits on a small square. There's this beautiful square. Uh, it was raining the day we were there in May of 2005. Uh, this is the church. You look at some of the church looks old, some of the church looks new. That's because it was bombed in World War II. Right? And inside the church are people. They've come to see the birthplace of the Pope and the church in which he was baptized. And you have one woman here, this woman right here, and she is their volunteer docent. She's the only person who really knows anything about what's going on there. She speaks only German. There are no brochures. She, you know, uh, he, I don't know, he was born here. He moved away when he was about two. We don't know that much. Enjoy our town. <laughs> they put up a banner. They put up a banner, right? Just like we do outside the dorms here, right? Okay. They had no idea what had just happened inside that church. But down the street was the bakery. There are two bakeries in this town. And this bakery, the Winsenholheim, is the Ratzinger Torch. <laughs> and Vatican Brot, right? <laughs> right? Uh, one pound euro, one, one, pound, one euro fifty uh, for a half a kilo of bread. I mean, even if it's not Vatican bread, that's not a bad price, right? I mentioned there were two bakeries. They are battling to see who will go down in history as the Pope's baker. Look at this. <laughs> right? 
And while down the street they focused in on the Ratzinger tort and the, uh, and the Vatican broke, right, these guys, they're going after it. They've got little puffs that look like miter hats. <laughs> all right, this is what they're doing, all right? All right? Meanwhile, in the church, you know, there's our, there is our uh, pilgrim lighting candles, but not much else is happening. Out inside, they don't get it. Outside, if the brewer, if the baker gets it, who else gets it? The brewer. <laughs> the brewer gets it, right? There you go. <laughs> All right? All right? The brewer gets the market response. Right? And here is you know, this is a, a German, if your German is as poor as mine, you need somebody, to, and the text was this bad, you need a celebrant. But it says, to celebrate the election of, new, of the new Pope Benedict XVI, the Weidenheiter Brewery has produced Pope's beer, Pops beer, in record time. The idea for it came to Fritz Weidenheiter, the manager of the brewery, in his sleep. You know he's laying there in bed going, oh, God, how can I make money from this, right? This is what he's thinking, right? 19 hours later, he's pouring what had up until that point been called private light, or in German, private hell, which I think is an interesting name for a beer, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> the local religious authorities come and bless, this is, if you've been to altitude, right? This is one of the vats, there's, and he's sitting, you can see the smile on his face. You know he's sitting, smiling, they think, what a friend we have in Jesus. Right, this is, he's, you can't see him humming it, but you know what's going on there, right? You need an endorser, right? There is the Archbishop of Cologne, right? 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 Uh, but we look at data. We don't look at anecdote as in marketing. We want data. So we look at, and, and God bless the Germans, they collect data on everything. So when you travel in Germany and you check into the hotel, they keep track of how many arrivals, and this is county level, not township level data. Um, I don't have any township, but trust me, there was nothing else going on in that county. This here tells you the number of arrivals, people who have arrived. It was pretty stable until 2005, and it ticked up some in that county. It ticked up about 20,000 new people. And if you look at this, as, this is number of nights stayed up on the top. Right? The lines don't quite add up, but it's number of nights stayed. And more people came, and they stayed longer, because something happened in 2005. Now, that could have been, you know, change in exchange rates. Everybody decided, let's go to Germany. Let's head to Bavaria, see what's going on. So we look at what happened in Bavaria at the same time. So you've got those same lines. People tend to stay in Bavaria more than they stay down in that one little county. That makes sense, because you've got Munich. You've got all kinds of stuff going on there. These numbers are so big, it's hard to get sort of a sense. So let's look at night per visit. That, to me, is the data that matters. Look at this. Nights per visit. How long did people stay for each arrival? And it jumps up. It goes up about a half a night, which is, for a hotel, that's a big darn deal over the course of a year. And if you look at what happened in the county or in the, in the state as a whole, their nights per visit were going down while it was going up. There was economic impact that happened. You see, it kind of levels off, and actually, if I give you the 09 and 010 data, it starts to plummet. And I'll tell you why. Um, because as it turns out, he was a deeply unpopular pope. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this is, let's add this to our list of things you need for a pilgrimage site to succeed, is they need to be popular. Beloved at a minimum. Okay? Uh, he was not, in fact, uh, and he was not particularly liked in Germany. At, at, in the beginning, the Bavarians were saying, no, he's not yours, he's ours, and by the end, the Germans were saying, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he's yours, he's not ours, all right? Um, so I went back six years later to see what had happened, and the state of Bavaria invested heavily in, uh, in 
uh, making this work, making this a place of destination. They built the Audubon out to the very edge of the world to get there. Um, they put up signage. There he is. And there, you remember the picture of the church? This is the uh, baptismal font. It was not in the church in 2005. They hauled this thing out of storage. I'll, Lord knows where they found it. Is it the baptismal font? I have no idea. They pulled this thing out of storage and declared it the baptismal font. It might well have been. Who knows, right? Um, <laughs> signage increases, right? Because you've got to, people are coming, you've got to direct them. Where are they going to go? So you now have a museum of local history. It was not there. It was an empty, decrepit building. You have the Church of the Baptism. It didn't, they didn't call it the Taufkirche in the old days, right? You've got a tourist shop with, and this is important, free bathrooms. That's important, isn't it, right? You've got a place to go to the bathroom. You've got the birth house, and you park your buses over there, right? Assuming, which means they think buses are coming, right? And you get there, this was an empty building. It is now the museum. This is the museum. Back here is the state-owned investment, all right, which includes uh, the gift shop. Don't worry, they've got one. Uh, a marketer would walk in and say, everything's on sale. That's not a good sign, all right? But it's got a, it's got a gift shop. Uh, it has public restrooms, it's got uh, information, you can buy videos, I bought a bunch of stuff there, I won't share it with you today. And this is down the street, the birth house is over here. Uh, there it is, there's the birth house. You'll notice the mailbox is gone. Claudia and Joseph Dandel, whom you've never heard of and never will again, <laughs> sold it to somebody who saw a commercial opportunity and they moved to the country, right? took their money and ran. And you now enter, instead of going through the front door, you enter through the back here. It's a large house and then there's a large area in the back that has what were the stables and all of that, a courtyard with the stables. You pay here 10 euro, you pay here 10 euro to go in, all right? That's, you're thinking that's not a bad price to see the home, the, the Geburst house of a pope, all right? And then you tour through in the inside here. I know we're, get, we're getting close to the edge of time here, but they've changed the sign. They're up to date. We come in the back, look at all the people, right? Open the, <laughs> open the doors and see all the people. Where are they, right? They must be in the videography room where they show you the story of his life. <laughs> Did I mention he was a deeply unpopular pope? <laughs> Is this good or bad for the town? They have a, oh, what did you say? At least they have a bathroom. So, well, there's a bathroom. Uh, no, they're not in the church. Where are they? Well, look, but outside in that sort of rundown old square, you have, ten, you have, you have umbrellas and there are people sitting under there. This is a Sunday morning. And they're out there. <laughs> and there they are. And, they, and they're on bicycles. Remember, it sits on the Inn River. And remember that path that I showed you? And remember the public bathrooms. <laughs> and so this is where people stop. And they stop to use the bathroom. And they stop to eat. All right? And then the market suddenly, out of this pilgrimage comes actually economic vitality for the town whether the pilgrimage succeeded or not. There they are. So what do we learn? Pilgrimage is exchange. There are lots of things we learn, but in our short time together here, whether or not the benefits are clear, marketing systems that develop around cities of pilgrimage are not accidental. Sometimes we call them emergent, which means they just sort of happen. Sometimes they're structured. You saw the German government and other agencies come in and try and bring some structure to this, anticipating good things. <laughs> the benefits enjoyed by those in the emergent structured system may be entirely different from those that are engaged in the core exchange. So for those handful of people who are coming on pilgrimage, what they wanted is still there. 
But for all these other people, things have happened. Uh, so what do we learn in terms of theory of exchange? Markets emerge as a consequence of need for exchange. Markets serve the needs of pilgrims, but they're not exclusive to those needs. And once established, they can repurpose themselves as need be. So thank you for going with me to Germany. Uh, it was a nice trip. Uh, nobody's jet lagged, I hope. So. <laughs>